Well, good afternoon. My name is Mike Mack, and I'm a cardiac surgeon from Dallas, Texas, and we're here at the Society of Thoracic Surgery meeting in Los Angeles, California. We're fortunate to have a very distinguished panel with us today who's going to discuss the role of transcatheter aortic valve replacement and the role specifically of surgeons in this. We have, uh, as I mentioned, a very distinguished panel, and I'd like each of them to introduce themselves, talking with Dr. Zito, uh, starting with Dr. Zito over here on my right. Wilson. Well, thank you, Mike, for arranging and organizing this. It certainly is a privilege to be here. My name is Wilson Zito. I am a cardiovascular surgeon from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, from Philadelphia, and um, I've been involved with TAVR, um, and it has certainly been a privilege to be doing so. Neil? My name is Neil Kleinman. I'm the lone interventional cardiologist at the session. I'm from Methodist Abakey Heart and Vascular Institute in Houston. And you notice, Neil, that we put you in between all the surgeons, so. But you're on tape. <laughs> uh, Vino. I'm Vino Thorani. I'm one of the cardiac surgeons at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And again, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this a very important endeavor. So uh, all of us are involved with heart teams uh, as we deliver uh, TAVR procedures uh, to patients. Uh, Wilson, perhaps you could start by telling us how it works at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, who's on the heart team and what is each person's role on that heart team? That's a very good question and um, our heart team is a, is a multidisciplinary approach at the University of Pennsylvania, similar to most programs. Um, not only are the cardiologists and surgeons fully engaged, but with equal partnership in evaluating patients, not only doing so but also participating in the operating room with a hybrid OR, but as an extensive team that includes uh, neurologists, anesthesiologists, perfusionists and, and the, and the mid-level nurse practitioners and research coordinators that help us uh, try to manage such a um, big, big um, endeavor and operation in, in managing these patients. So it is a, it is a big team that fully is uh, in the spirit of collaboration. So, Neil, uh, about five or six or seven years ago when all of us knew TAVR was coming, there was a lot of angst in the surgical community about how surgeons gain wire skills and experience in TAVR. Can you kind of march us through how things have worked uh, in, uh, at Methodist in Houston and what the role of the surgeons are, and have you been able to successfully train any of us? Well, the short answer is absolutely yes. We've been able to train the surgeons very nicely. I feel very comfortable with my surgical folks doing the catheter-based skills. Uh, it, uh, it took a few months to get everyone comfortable. Part of that's not only having a surgeon being comfortable with the technique, but probably a little tougher is to have the cardiologist comfortable watching the surgeon use a, a catheter. But th those skills are fairly basic. They're not difficult to learn. Uh, we've also learned that the uh, degree of, of caution that the cardiologist will apply when uh, entering a vessel, for example, is a little different than the way the surgeon will view it, simply because uh, conversion to an open repair uh, isn't a big deal for the surgeon, whereas to a cardiologist, it's something very daunting. So, Vino, you're an extremely <coughs> experienced uh, 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 TAVR surgeon. Um, you train traditionally in cardiac surgery. Uh, how did you get to become so experienced? Where did you learn your skills? Well, um, <coughs> I, I gained a lot of the experience in preparation for knowing that we were going to have transcatheter valve program at our institution. So in 2007, as we knew we were about to enroll in the partner trial, I spent about six months to eight months actually in the cath lab. And uh, every, I had one day a week where I was dedicated to be in the cath lab. And uh, Vasilis Babaloros and Peter Block actually taught me how to do catheter based skills. And that's really where, we, where I gained uh, my uptick in structural heart catheter skills. And from there, I've continued to work with a cardiologist and gaining that. I think that potentially the new people going into, into a transcatheter valve may need an extended six months to a year fellowship. And we're offering that but uh, there are different ways of doing it. At the beginning, that's how I started. It's just being in the cath lab and working with cardiologists and learning from them. 
Uh, Wilson, you've got a very busy program at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, how many surgeons and how many cardiologists perform TAVR procedures, and how do you bring new, new folks on? Do you have a fellowship program? How are you teaching younger uh, surgeons and cardiologists uh, TAVR skills? I think that's a great question and is an, and is an important question. Uh, our initial team comprised of two surgeons and two cardiologists, but as you alluded to, the volume of TAVR has significantly increased over the last four and a half years. Currently, we have five surgeons uh, on the transcatheter team who are actual implanters, and there are now four cardiologists who are also part of the team. Now, training, you bring up a good point, because uh, uh, one of our mission, academic mission, is education. And we have a robust training program, not only in the core residents, the, the ABTS residents, where they have early exposure not only in the cath lab, but with the TAVR procedures, but certainly um, uh, residents who have finished their accredited training and now are seeking additional fellowships. And we offer one-year fellowships for, patient, or for those fellows who want additional training in catheter-based therapy. So, Neil, there's a number of practicing both cardiologists and cardiac surgeons out there who have no experience, have no access to a large center. Uh, how do they gain the skills or how do they begin to participate or get a TAVR program going in their hospital? Well, the first thing they have to do is uh, there's a fair amount to learn about TAVR before you even get close to starting. So we spent about a year learning some of the basics uh, well in advance of uh, doing our first implant. I think that's the basic skill. The second skill is that uh, all of those individuals need A, to be comfortable working with one another, and B, to be comfortable taking care of critically ill, very delicate patients with advanced valvular heart disease. I think once those things have happened, then there are a number of centers that are developing as training centers where these procedures will be taught. The other thing is that there are now a number of people in the U.S who are very good at uh, doing this procedure and who are very good at teaching it. And, for example, in our own institution, after having been fairly busy for the last two years, we are still very excited when we can get someone who's more experienced than we are to come down and help us with some cases. So, Vino, we hear a lot about the heart team. Uh, is it real? Is it, um, is it just lip service? And if it's real, is it going to be able to stay together long term? Very good question. I, I do think it's real. I do think still to this day, after, um, and I know this for a lot of the large uh, volume centers, cardiologists, surgeons are making decisions together on the type of patient we're going to operate on. They're meeting together about the type of access that's going to be utilized uh, to do this procedure. So I do think the heart team is in 2013, January, it is still alive. Um, as the profile of the devices and the new generation devices come about with smaller and smaller devices and the 60-40 split of TFTA maybe becomes 80 or 90 percent TF and only 10 to 20 percent become non-TF platforms, I'm not sure that the heart team is going to stay together. It, well, sad, and I think a lot of us who started doing this in 2006 and 2007 in the United States, I hope it stays together. I think part of it depends on CMS reimbursement. If CMS reimbursement stays where, stays in place where surgeons and cardiologists are required for reimbursement, I think it will. My fear is, my hope is that it uh, that it will not, for basically logistics reasons, and also for reimbursement reasons, that we won't be able to keep it together. But um, it's uh, the future will tell. Wilson, how does the heart team work at the University of Pennsylvania? Do you just do procedures together? Do you evaluate patients together in clinic? Do you take care of them, uh, patients postoperatively together? That's a very good question. And um, to echo what Vino just uh, mentioned, uh, you know, I, 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 um, I, I find a cardiology, surgery, heart team relationship very sacred. I think um, there was some skepticism early on but that, in, at least in our institution, that relationship has, got, has even gotten stronger over the last four and a half years. Um, it's not just a procedure that we do 
uh, together, uh, preoperative evaluation, um, postoperative management, and just as important, long-term follow-up. We do it together in the valve clinic. So I think it's a commitment at your institution to keep the heart team um, concept going if that is your commitment. But a, a, I agree with Vino Thorani that there may be non-medical pressures that may uh, threaten to um, um, compromise the heart team concept. Neil, uh, you've got a newfound friendship with Dr. Reardon. Uh, at Methodist Hospital. Can you kind of speak a little bit about the dynamics of how you two function together on the heart team? We, um, we really run the heart team uh, very closely together. Uh, virtually everything that we do uh, is done jointly. We have uh, two joint valve clinics per week that are staffed by Dr. Reardon's team and by our team. Um, we review studies together daily. We see patients together almost daily and then we perform the procedures together as well as manage the administrative details jointly together uh, almost on a daily basis. So the partnership really is exceptionally close and I've got to say it's, uh, it's nothing like I'd ever imagined even as we started. So we've got about uh Two minutes left here, Wilson, so could it, everybody likes to hear about what's going to happen in the future. Can you give us your 30 seconds of what the future of TAVR is in the United States? Great question. Um, I think TAVR will continue to increase in terms of its penetration in the market. Uh, I hope we can do it in a responsible way, but I think, I think certainly with technologic advancement, we've seen it in all fields, that there will be continued improvement and refinements. So my, my parting shot, I believe, is that TAVR will continue to improve so that we can better serve our patients, but it will be just one of the platforms that we can offer patients with valvular disease. Vino, your insight into the future? I think that, as Wilson mentioned, there will be refinement of the procedure, but I think that what's going to really, what we will see hopefully in the next one to two to three years is refinements in the complications that occur with the current first-generation valves. So we'll see hopefully devices to decrease paravalvular leak rate to decrease stroke rate um, and vascular complication rate. So I think we're going to start seeing that hopefully that progression over the next couple of years to mitigate some of the morbidity and mortality we're, we're worried about earlier on in generation one uh, devices. So hopefully that's really what we're going to see in the future. So Neil, we would like to thank you for coming to join us uh, uh, here at the uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons. And to show that we're good hosts, we're going to give you the final word on the future of taverns. <laughs> well, I think there are several things. I think we will see refinement of the devices and of the technique. I think we'll see refinement of the post-operative management. We'll learn more about anticoagulation and antithrombotic strategies in these patients. I think on the front end, we'll learn more about the diagnostic procedures we use to select patients for TAVR. We've learned the hard way that not all patients with aortic stenosis are appropriate candidates for the technique, for the procedure. So I think we'll see all those things advance. And I, I'd be a little remiss in my job if I didn't remind people that we'll see three-year partner results at the ACC in March. Great. Well, I'd like to thank the panel for a, a, a great discussion. We hope that our audience finds this to be of value uh, as they uh, embrace this new technology and this new uh, uh, pathway of being able to treat patients with severe aortic stenosis. Thank